This is Texas Tech University. Tonight on 24 Frames, we look into Texas Tech's own Crossroads Studio. We check out what's behind the strong element of community in CrossFit. Pitmasters tell us why they love barbecue. We go on a sacred journey with filmmaker Shane Nasiri. And Sugar Witch plays in our South Plains sessions. 24 Frames starts right now. Up until we built this recording studio, there were some small, like little office areas up on the second floor where the digital media studio is, and not much bigger than a closet up there, and they had some little inbox things so that people could go in and do their own projects. Um, of course, it sometimes got too loud, and some of the profanity and things like that was a little bit off-putting to some of the uh, other patrons on the floor. And then one day, I, got, I was just sitting at my desk here at the Southwest Collection, and I get a call from the front, and they said, Dean Dial's here to see you. And I said, oh, okay, what's this all about? And I went up there, and he goes, can you build me a recording studio? And I said, sure, let's do it. First order of business was to find a location. It's strange. I always tell people it's like the it's the the quietest place in the library, adjacent to the loudest place. But luckily, the sound the soundproofing in here is pretty good. So as long as we have all of our doors closed, it's it's pretty well hidden. There's been a couple of times when I've forgotten to close one of the doors, and the, it's crazy how much sound escapes. But yeah, I've had a couple of disgruntled studiers, but you know, it's a pretty easy fix. I just have to close it. This is actually the quiet floor of the library. There's people out there studying and it's really quiet and then there's this recording studio down here. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a strange contrast. A strange place to have a studio, but it works. Margaret Noble was a Scotch-Irish woman Born in the fall in Dungan town so the first day, they walk through the door, and I probably haven't ever met them before, so we do our introductions. They, they are required to fill out some information about their project. On our website, we have a place where you can request time. You go online, and you fill out some information about your band, how many instruments you have in your band. We get a little bit of information that way, but it's usually not the full story, so I would sit down with them and try to figure out what their goal is, um, how many songs they plan on recording. We do everything. I mean, yeah, singer-songwriter, rap, thrash metal, um, Texas country, classical. Pretty much anything that needs recording here at Texas Tech, we do. It's a free service for students, faculty, and staff. Uh, we provide audio services for the Texas Tech community at large. So basically what we're doing here are people that have no idea about recording and you know don't know what to do. It gives them a place to come in and begin to learn about the recording process. I think sometimes people think that it's not going to take very long, like if it only takes five minutes to sing a song and they don't realize, you know, it takes a lot of time to get the, you got to get the sound and also you're going to hear yourself so you're going to want to um, make sure it sounds good, you know. Maybe probably the first thing you put down is not your best take. It's just getting the word out. I, although we're booked up all the time, you know, and a lot of people know about it, there's a lot of people that don't know about it. It's a good quality studio recording. It's professional and it's something that they can use, you know to release or to send out as needed to whoever they need to send it to. I found out about CrossFit in probably late 2005, early 2006. 
I watched it and it was just people doing cool stuff like climbing ropes and throwing around a lot of weight and they weren't like big, burly, huge dudes necessarily. It was just like athletic kind of physiques. It was cool to actually see people doing that again instead of just the typical, hey, Monday is chest day, Tuesday it's shoulders. And so I started just watching those videos and incorporating more and more to that in the training. It was three and a half, I guess, years later that uh, went out to California to Camp Pendleton with another one of our coaches and we got certified there. The thing about CrossFit that makes it different is the community is a big part of it. You're working out with people uh, that you wouldn't necessarily meet outside of the gym, people of all walks of life, all ages, all athletic backgrounds. Me personally, I wasn't really an athlete growing up. I did sports but didn't love it. Uh, and then when I found CrossFit, it was just something totally different. Every workout was different. It was fun, it was exciting. Every day you see improvement. Um, and I'm a very goal-oriented person, so that really resonated with me. And this many years later, it's still fun, it's still exciting, and um, it's just been really great to see it grow. Well, I was a personal trainer before I started uh, coming to CrossFit, so I had experience with one-on-one -on -one coaching. Anyway, just going to women's homes and training them in their homes. The owner of the box, Brian and Miranda, they said, hey, you know, we know you like this, we know this is something you enjoy, would you want to start teaching a fit camp? So that's how I got interested in teaching up here. And then I went about, after about six months of doing fit camp, I went and got my, my L1. And after that, I started teaching some of the CrossFit classes. I started CrossFit just about a year and a half ago. The girl I had a crush on actually was, uh, had been a member here for about two years at CrossFit Midland. It worked out, I love CrossFit, and I'm engaged now, so it worked out good. To, to that girl, yes, yes, yes. The community of CrossFit is built in the workouts. You're surrounded by people during the workout the whole time, you're encouraging each other, you're pushing each other, and it feels like you're working out together. You want to do good for yourself, but you also want to do well for them so that you're both getting better. I think the thing that makes people fall in love with CrossFit is like deep down, like kind of your body, your mind, your heart knows like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like this is how I was meant to move. Like I'm not meant to be confined to a specific program, tied to a machine. You never know what's coming up in, in daily life, right? Like Tuesday afternoon, you get hit in the face with something and you weren't expecting it. CrossFit prepares you for that. Not only physically, but I think mentally also. Like, it makes people tough. And I think people want to be tough in general. They just don't know it and they're not willing to push themselves there. But when they're looking around and they're like, oh, she's doing this and she's still going, why am I resting? So I think that's the thing and, and kind of the addictive nature of, of it is from the excitement you get by kind of realizing, man, this is what I was supposed to do. Uh, you develop relationships with people in here and you find the people that you click with and those people push you to work harder. So it doesn't matter what age you are, you can work out with a 20 year old or a four, my 14 year old son comes and it's just nice to have someone there rooting for you and patting you on the back and saying, hey, good job, or when you're struggling to help pick you up whenever you get down on yourself. If somebody was interested in CrossFit or curious about it, I'd really just encourage them to come in uh, drop in to a box or gym um, and try out a workout. Most of, the, most of the gym or boxes will usually let you drop in and just try out a workout or just kind of come and check it out. I would just encourage just to try it. Have an open mind about it um, and just try to get over the hump, meet a few people, and I promise you'll get hooked to it. Texas, we're a big cattle state, and a lot of ranchers, a lot of cowboys. Uh, it's just part of the tradition of uh, Texas. Uh, out here in West Texas, we've got some good cattle raisers, and, and uh, people get real serious about their, their beef and getting their barbecue on here. So uh, anytime you take a cut of meat, flavor it with wood, uh, people, uh, you ask 10 different people about that, their opinions on it, and you'll get 10 different answers.
Barbecue, you know, it's going back to the old days, it's taking a cheap piece of meat, which is no longer cheap these days, and cooking it for a long time to get the tenderness and flavor. I think it's just kind of using, you know, a lesser quality of meat to make a really good meal. Of course, there's gotta be smoke and, you know, flavor on it. Uh, the wood, to me, is 100% is of the, uh, the process. Uh, I mean, if you don't start with a good product, you're not going to finish with a good product. So here we use hickory, strictly hickory wood. I think in Texas, if you're going to bill yourself as an authentic barbecue joint, a live fire is, is hard to get around. There's such a depth of flavor that's developed through the compounds and the smoke and, and fire itself that develop the, that flavor profile that you can't replicate through uh, electric or gas. Uh, there are hybrid smokers um, that operate on both gas and wood, so you basically use wood when it's convenient, and, and then you can walk away and, and let it run off of a thermostat and gas uh, to finish the cook. So uh, I, I would say that that's better than than no wood at all. But I, in in my opinion, all wood is is the only way to really develop those those flavor profiles. I could be with anyone Just while the honeymoon burns bright No electricity that keeps things light And I'm not saying that it's right Or saying that it's always right I'm just saying that it's not a lie I don't, I don't think that you I ever get used to, to the late nights and the just early mornings or the all-nighters. It's a lifestyle owning this sort of food establishment. It's not just a job. So you have to really um, adjust your life, go to bed earlier, rest on your days off, because um, it's not just something that you can leave work at work. It's it, This is our, our work, it's our life. When I took this over in 1980, my goal was to leave it exactly like it was because it was successful and it, it's, I mean, it's worked ever since, so I'm kind of old school. If it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> it's fun because anybody can get out in their backyard and try it. You know, you may not be great at it, but, you know, have friends and family over kind of gathering and, you know, it's kind of a social event. I know that the more I, I cooked, the, the more of a feel I got for what I was doing. Uh, for the most part, barbecue is a mystery until you take a bite. You could put in 18 hours and everything could look good and you go to take a bite and it was off. The seasoning was off or the smoke was off or it was overcooked or undercooked at that point. The more you do it, the, the more you're around it, the more you smell it, the more you see it, the more you feel it, the more confident you are. If I know that this piece of meat should have come off at seven, but today it's just not ready at that point, then I'm confident leaving it on to finish. And likewise, if, uh, if I feel like it should have come off at seven, but at 5.30 it, it feels and looks and, and acts like it's cooked through, uh, then, then I have to be confident enough to pull it at that point. Tom and Bingo's in this location opened November 1952. I'm second generation in it. I would say 70% of my customers that come in here know what they're gonna order before they ever get up to the counter. I mean, we try to be real consistent each day with what we do. Uh, we don't change anything, so we offer the same products, and, and uh, I think they just, uh, they know, they, they expect that they're gonna get what they get when they order, so, uh, yeah. Different woods do different things to different cuts of meat. Uh, like, for instance, if I'm gonna grill a steak, I like a good mesquite coal. Oak in itself is very, very mild. Um, so if I'm doing a 16 to 19 hour cook, I don't have to worry about overdoing it, getting it too smoky. You can over smoke it and then you kind of get a bitterness and you get heartburn and a lot of that stuff. So getting the right amount of smoke on it to hit the general public, some people like it really smoky. Some people don't like much smoke at all. Oak is kind of a safe alternative, very mild, and allows for a really long cook. 
but if I'm doing a bulk piece of meat like a brisket or a prime rib or a pork butt, uh, hickory to me is just, it's a hotter burning wood, uh, puts a great flavor into the meat that you're cooking. So to me, it's the Cadillac. So you talk about the barbecue renaissance and, and the fan following and people going out of their way. I mean, they, they've got places now that they reference as destination barbecue where uh, people set out on a weekend barbecue crawl across Texas to hit 12 places in 10 meals. And it's, I, I can't explain what it is other than you're either in, in that groove and, and providing something that you can't get anywhere else or you're not. You know, I think I think some of it has to do with sort of a primal sense, just the meat and the fire, and it's nothing fancy, and there's not this fancy kitchen with, you know, the thermostat that you set it, and you go home and sleep and come back, and you have this delicious brisket. There's uh, something about the fire and the wood and the maintenance of that, and knowing what the people that prepared it have sacrificed and gone through, which sounds so dramatic, but it's true. It's, I think it's an art and I think that it's um, something special and people that do it really good attract people from other places because you can only have barbecue like that, I think a handful of places in the world. Ven conmigo a caminar tierras sagradas.
shiny black shoes and his ruby red lips don't lie. Open up the throttle, take a swig from the bottle, let's fly. Texas Tech University.
My name, when I started kindergarten, was Ramon. And by the time I was in the second grade, everybody was calling me Raymond. You know, out in the playground, in the classroom, Raymond, hey, Raymond, hey, Raymond. And they trying to adjust to this, you know what I mean? And if there was a girl named Maria, her name became Mary. And Juanita became Jane. So one day, we got a new student by the name of Facundo Gonzalez. Facundo Gonzalez, man. When he came into school, we noticed they called an emergency administrative meeting. You kind of hear him talking through the doors. What are we going to do with this guy, man? You know what I mean? How are we going to change his name, you know? And one teacher goes, well, you know what? Why don't we try to shorten the name a little bit? And they go, yeah, well, but how do you spell it? F-A-C-U-N-D-O. And they go, why don't we just spell it F-A-C? And one of the teachers goes, well, that was, it means his name would be Fock. And the other teachers looked at it. No, that, you know, that sounds too much like, that, like a dirty word. You, know, you can't be saying Fock. Where's your homework, you know? Where's Fock at, you know what I mean? So that was a trip we always remembered going to elementary school because Facundo was the only guy who never got his name changed.